we have good nuts and bolts stories are appearing about what actually happens in the brain. This is why we are living in such an interesting time. You see <coughs> how these people can clearly delineate per certain areas of premotor cortex where you have a shift of functional properties in the moment where the rubber hand becomes a part of your experiential self. And you can do this at home. Try it. Um, the thing is, you must stroke synchronously and you must stroke at least 30 to 60 seconds and you must make your subject not look in your face but must make your subject really look on the probe or the brush or whatever you're using. So much about mindness. Here's the second target property we have to understand. It's the property of selfhood. Some crazy German philosophers call this prereflexive Selbstvertrautheit. <laughs> Pre-reflexive self-intimacy, the way of being infinitely close to yourself before you even start any thought or cognitive activity. Here are examples how we speak about this. We say things like, I am someone. I experience myself as being identical through time. The contents of my phenomenal self-consciousness form a coherent whole. Before initiating and independently of any intellectual operations, I'm already directly, whatever that may mean, acquainted with the contents of my self-consciousness. And here's the third and last target property we must understand, and that's the property of perspectivalness. That is a structural property of your experiential space as a whole. It possesses an immovable center. Now, here is the mystery, a mystery Thomas Nagel wrote a lot about. For each one of you, it is true that you are this center yourself. To be phenomenally aware means to possess an inward perspective and to take on this perspective in the subjective experience of the world and of your own mental states. But if you say, I am this center myself, you don't really understand what you're saying. This is where the puzzle occurs when you fl flip from a third person description of a property of conscious space into a first person description by using a concept like myself. What I want to do now is I want to analyze these phenomenal properties on the representationalist and functionalist level, on lower levels of description. I want to ask what would it mean for a given information processing system to instantiate these properties. Let us start by analyzing these target properties. My first step will be to introduce a new theoretical entity. That's the phenomenal self-model, or the conscious self-model, or the PSM. I say something like that exists, and it will be found on all levels of explanation. It's a distinct theoretical entity. And at the very end of this talk, I will introduce a second theoretical entity. It forms the representational instantiation basis of the phenomenal, the conscious properties that we want to explain. Let me give you some ideas about what I mean by the notion of a self-model. It's only episodically active, it's a representational entity, and the content of that representation is the very system in which it appears. From a logical point of view, you can distinguish three classes of information processing systems. Some can do simulations. Think of the meteorolo meteorology department, a computer that simulates weather movements, cloud movements. Then there are more complex machines, machines that can emulate non-observable properties of another computer. For instance, if on your Windows desktop you make the pocket calculator come up, or if a very clever Turing mach machine pre pretends to be a stupid Turing machine then you have the situation where one information processing system emulates another one. It emulates the internal information flow. What I am saying is that we are a system that do both of these things. We simulate and we emulate, 
And if you have the special case that target system and processing system are identical, then you have the case of self-modeling. So what I'm saying is that you all, as you're sitting here, are systems that simulate and emulate themselves for themselves as they're listening to me. A background assumption is that this self-model possesses a true neurobiological description, some activation vector. It, it is some complex activation pattern in the human brain, but I will not talk about this today, being a philosopher. The phenomenal, the conscious self-model is that part of the mental self-model which is currently embedded into the highest order integrated structure, the global model of the world. This will be very easy to see for all those of you who are interested in psychotherapy. Human beings have an integrated self-model in their brain, not much of it is conscious, but of course it is clear that parts of your unconscious self-model can have causal properties and influence, say, endocrine output, psychosomatic interactions as we call them. So there is a conscious and an unconscious layer and what is conscious is variable. As philosophers say, the phenomenal content of the self-model supervenes locally. That is, for the experiential content, it is true that all of, if all of your brain properties are fixed, all of your properties of your phenomenal self-model are fixed as well, which doesn't yet imply that there's a reductive explanation. The phenomenal self-model in, self in our own case is a plastic structure changes over lifetime. It's a multimodal structure. Many different sensory organs from your blood vessels, from your vestibular organ and so forth feed into it. And possibly it evolved from a partially innate and hardwired model of the spatial properties of the system. Some British philosophers have spoken about a long-term body image you know the stories of Damasio and Melsak, maybe. More about this later. An active self-model, it's important to understand this is not a little man in the head. It's a sub-personal functional state. That is, again, philosophically speaking, it is characterized by a distinct causal role. And from a strictly analytical perspective, it's a set of causal relations. And if anybody here still believes in classical cognitive science, we might say something like that. It's a transient computational module which is episodically activated by the system in order to regulate its interaction with the environment. Uh, that's a very complicated way of saying what happens when you wake up in the morning. When you come to yourself, then the organism which you are, that's what I'm saying at least, has to achieve complex sensory motor integration you have to go to the refrigerator or to the toilet. And then it needs this transient computational model, the conscious self-model, and it just switches it on. And this is the moment when you wake up, when you come into existence as a conscious being. For those of you who are interested in logic, there's a formal proof by Conant and Ashby in 1970 that every complex system that has a regulator that regulates its own behavior will automatically, by necessity, turn this regulator into a model of the system as a whole. That's pretty intuitive. If you have to regulate the different parts, you have to map them somewhere. I also make a teleofunctionalist background assumption. The development of the activation and the, uh, the activation of this module plays a role for the system. It's good to have it in pursuing your goals. The functional mo self model processes a true evolutionary description. That is, it was a weapon which was invented and optimized in the course of a cognitive arms race. And that rather unromantic quote comes from Andy Clark from his 1989 book. So the idea is that what we have now as our conscious self model is something that has a long history and emerged out of a basically competitive process. It consists in a very specific achievement, the capacity not only to open representational spaces, but to open centered representational spaces, spaced, spaces centered around a model of the self. And before all this gets too boring, I want to give you two low-level examples of what I mean by a self-model. 
astronauts in space frequently get the following problem. They cannot feel where up and down is in their body anymore. It's, it's like a radicalized version of motion sickness. And um, it's, you know, it's difficult if you're trying to eat, if you can't feel do tap down in your body anymore. Every astronaut knows how to help his body if he has that problem. You just hit very hard on the heel from below, on the, uh, on the sole of the shoe. And instantly the body image locks in again and there's this conscious experience, this is down, this is up. And every um, astronaut knows how to annoy his body, hit them on the head right afterwards, you know. So what that shows is that the human self model is just a virtual model. It depicts a possibility, philosophically very interestingly, as a reality. It's just the best hypothesis the system has about its own current state. And if it is under constrained by input, which it is in a spaceship, um, then it can become highly context sensitive. You just have to knock on the back of the foot and it locks in and down suddenly is there. So um, the self model is a simulation, a virtual model. Now I guess many of you have heard of San Diego's Ramachandran and phantoms in the brain and the main, many patients he has. And I used to go to lunch with him when I spent a year at UC San Diego in 89, 99. And how many of you have heard of these mirror experiments, mirror synesthesia? You have these people who <clears throat> have an amputated arm and they have a phantom limb. And usually that phantom limb will go away within a couple of weeks with a so-called telescoping effect. It, the phantom limb could become smaller and smaller, you can make a fist in the stump and then it disappears. Some people, however, have a hurting phantom limb that is paralyzed and stays up to 12 years. And if, I mean, how do you cure pain in a non-existing limb, right? Uh, if you want to help these patients, one knows the first thing you have to do is you have to regain volitional control. You have to make it mobile. But it doesn't work. So the task Ramachandran did with one of his patients who had this paralyzed phantom limb for 12 years was now make butterfly-like symmetrical movements like this. What is your conscious experience? And the patient says, well, doctor, what is my conscious experience? My good arm moves, the phantom limb is paralyzed. Now what you do is you put a mirror down in the middle and say, can you please do the same thing again and look at the mirror from the side? And the patient will exclaim, doctor, doctor, my, my phantom limb moves. I can move my phantom limb for the first time in 12 years. You pull the mirror up or you tell the patient, close your eyes, and with great disappointment they will say, oh, it's frozen again. What moves in that experiment is what I call the phenomenal self-model. Here uh, you have the setup. Technically speaking, you install a virtual source of visual feedback which points into just the, right, the region of state space where the system sends its motor commands and never gets feedback. And you see something is moving there. It's the phenomenal self-model. Now let us start to um, continue our representationalist analysis of our three target properties. Remember the rubber hand illusion. What is mindness? All representational states which are